Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Center for Policy Research Land Rights Initiative, I'm very pleased to welcome all of you to our talk today. This is the 10th talk in the Land Rights Initiative speaker series, and I'm very pleased indeed to have with us today Professor Michael Vivian, who is going to talk to us about dispossession without development, land grabs in neoliberal India. Professor Levien is Assistant Professor of Sociology at Johns Hopkins University and he has written extensively in the fields of development sociology, political sociology, agrarian political economy and social theory with a specific geographic focus on India. Today he is going to talk to us about his forthcoming book, Dispossession Without Development, which is uh, going to be published by Oxford University Press. In the book, uh, he poses three questions that he's going to talk to us about today. How has land dispossession changed with the shift from state-led development to neoliberalism in India? Second, what are the consequences of this change for dispossessed farmers? And finally, what are the implications of this change for our understanding of India's land wars or land conflicts? So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Professor Levian. Thank you very much for um, having me here at CPR. And um, as Namita said, this book is about how land dispossession has changed from the period of state-led developmentalism to neoliberalism, what the consequences of that shift are for farmers, and what the implications are for the politics of land uh, in contemporary uh, India. Now, I'm going to start by giving an overview of the theoretical argument of the book. Um, and in making an argument about how land dispossession has changed in contemporary India, I argue that existing theories of the relationship between dispossession uh, and, develop, uh, and capitalism are inadequate to capture this, and I advance an alternative uh, theory. The first theory is what I call the modernization theory of dispossession. This is familiar. It's almost common sense. It's what most government uh, uh, officials and um, economic elites believe, which is that dispossession is a necessary and inevitable cost of development. There are, I think, a few problems with this theory um, from a social scientific perspective. The first is that the modernization perspective does not differentiate between the different forms of economic growth driving dispossession. So is a Formula One racetrack or a real estate colony just as much development as factories or uh, a dam? And because it doesn't distinguish between these purposes, it's essentially a normative argument for the unlimited, unlimited upward redistribution of land. No matter what the purpose is, land should be taken from uh, farmers for those who can put it to um, better use. Now, uh, higher values. Now, not only is that a political uh, and regressive political argument, but from a sociological perspective, it can't capture variation in the causes of dispossession, um, what if the character of growth changes in such a way that certain of these kinds of projects start to predominate over one another, and how does that affect the contentiousness of land dispossession? The second theory is a version of this argument. I call it the proletarian redemption theory of dispossession. This would be familiar to many of you as Marx's theory of primitive accumulation. The argument here is that dispossession is a necessary stage in the transition to capitalism and therefore socialism. Now, I think the main problem in applying this theory to contemporary forms of land dispossession is that they're simply not about creating a transition between pre-capitalism and capitalism. In fact, they represent the advanced capitalist demands on land. They often have little demand for the labor power of the dispossessed. And in no way can they really be interpreted as creating the material foundations for socialism. Um, for these reasons, I think that we need to dispatch with the widespread use of primitive accumulation as a term for understanding contemporary forms of land dispossession. We'll also add that it can't really capture variation in the forms of dispossession across time, across phases of capitalism, and across geography. Now, the third um, theory is what I call the predatory theory of dispossession. The most famous um, iteration of this theory is David Harvey's theory of accumulation by dispossession. I think that there um, 
Now, in brief, what the argument here is that dispossession is the predation of subaltern populations by neoliberal capitalism. There are a few shortcomings of this theory. Um, although Harvey usefully uh, makes it clear that contemporary forms of land dispossession are very much products of advanced capitalism, he first of all neglects the very central role of the state. Although he mentions it, he doesn't really develop it very much. Bigger problem is that Harvey generalizes from neoliberalism. He creates a general theory of dispossession from his specific analysis of neoliberalism. He views dispossession as a response to a uh, crisis of neoliberalism, and particularly of overaccumulated capital that's emerging in Western economies. Um, now, the problem with that is that many contemporary forms of land dispossession are driven by domestic capital. Uh, it's very difficult to say that they are a response to overaccumulation in Western economies. Uh, and moreover, in generalizing from neoliberalism, um, they can't capture land dispossession during the period of state capitalism. Um, what is the difference between land dispossession under neoliberalism, state capitalism, uh, colonialism? Harvey's theory doesn't really allow you to ask that question. His high-level abstraction also um, prevents him from asking the question um, or leaves the question open of how dispossession interacts with the specific inequalities of different kinds of agrarian milieu. Um, and though Harvey is not guilty of this, I'd say many theorists in the predatory uh, camp romanticize the dispossessed instead of seeing the deep inequalities that characterize many uh, rural milieu. So my argument is that we should start from uh, a simpler kind of sociological understanding of what dispossession is. I argue that land dispossession is a social relation of coercive redistribution, most often mediated by states. While capitalism creates systematic pressures to dispossess, the forms of accumulation and class interest driving dispossession vary across time and the uneven geographies of capitalist development. We can therefore think of dispossession as being organized into socially and historically specific regimes. Regimes of dispossession are, in my view, political apparatuses for coercively redistributing land. And I think they can be differentiated in other words, we can differentiate different regimes of dispossession by the forms of accumulation and class interests that drive them, and by the means through which they produce compliance to dispossession. So while under certain regimes can offer, for example, um, irrigated land or public sector jobs, other regimes, as I'll show, can only offer land prices, if anything. But the key, then, is to understand how different regimes of dispossession interact with particular agrarian milieu, right? The particular uh, agrarian social structures. Because this interaction, right, when different regimes of dispossession confront different uh, rural uh, milieu, this, I think, is key to understanding uh, divergent political responses to dispossession, whether it's, you know, compliance or resistance of various kinds. And when it does generate compliance, when states are able to elicit compliance uh, and dispossess land, it's important to see this as enabling specific trajectories of economic change and inequality, not generically development, right? Whether what actually results is development is something that's politically contested and fought at on the ground and demonstrably varies over time and space. So I think that what I hope to offer with this comparative perspective is a framework for thinking about how the political economy of dispossession varies over time and place while dispatching with the assumptions of political inevitability and economic progress. So my argument um, is that land dispossession uh, is a social relation of coercive redistribution, most often mediated by states. So I think I'd just try to start more sociologically with understanding of what is dispossession as a distinctive kind of social relation. Now, while capitalism creates systematic pressures to dispossess, the forms of accumulation and class interest driving dispossession vary across time and across the uneven geographies of capitalist development. So I suggest that we can think of dispossession, therefore, as being organized into socially and historically specific regimes, uh, regimes of dispossession. By which I mean basically political apparatuses for coercively redistributing land. They can be differentiated 
by the forms of accumulation and class interests that drive them, and by the means through which they produce compliance to dispossession. Right? While almost all forms of dispossession uh, by definition imply um, coercion, some amount of coercion, I think regimes of dispossession vary in the extent to which they can draw on legitimacies, uh, on legitimacy which rests in part on how persuasive the argument is that these things actually do serve development and also have different abilities um, to produce material compliance to dispossession, to create material incentives for farmers to relinquish their land. Um, the key, though, I think, to a sociological understanding of dispossession is to see how different regimes of dispossession interact with the features of diverse agrarian uh, milieu, which we know vary tremendously in their economic structures, in their um, class structures, in political histories, and that is key to understanding um, both the divergent political responses right, to dispossession that we see across rural India from sometimes willing compliance to different kinds of resistance. And when it does generate, when it does generate compliance, when the state is able to get farmers off their land, we can't just assume that the result is development. <laughs> we have to actually understand the specific trajectory of economic change and inequality right, that this generates, uh, but should not be reduced to the uh, homogenous term uh, development and normatively laid in term. So the, to me, the importance of this approach is to dispatch with assumptions of political inevitability and economic progress, yet still hang on to a comparative political economy of dispossession. All right, so that's the theoretical argument. Now I'm going to put some flesh on it. Um, and the first chapter of the book really tries to document the transition from a developmentalist to neoliberal regime of dispossession. Um, this would be familiar to many of you, but during the post-independence developmentalist period, Indian state Indian states largely acquired land uh, for public sector projects. Um, it was actually legal, right, as you know, um, Numita knows better than I, to acquire land for private companies. But the development model ensured that this remained fairly limited in practice. Um, also, most of these projects, the large dams, steel towns, industrial states, were kind of narrowly productivist. Right? Uh, it reflects the kind of productivist commitments of the Nehruvian state. There was often uh, policies in place to restrict speculation rather than facilitate it. Um, those didn't always work, but it was interesting that there are always, uh, in a lot of these projects, urban development and even kind of the, uh, the command area of dams. Um, now, my point here is not that um, this was a golden age of dispossession. Right? We know that the people who gave this huge literature, we know that uh, those who were dispossessed by dams were brutally impoverished, had almost no compensation, hardly any resettlement and rehabilitation. So it's not, um, this is not a normative argument to say that this was a better period of dispossession. That's absolutely, just to be clear, not what I'm arguing. Um, but I want to argue um, that the character of dispossession has changed pretty dramatically uh, since the early 1990s. And it really was the early 1990s. Um, by my archival research in the basements of industrial development corporations and urban development authorities, there's really actually quite a quick shift in the early 1990s um, in which you see like urban devel uh, industrial development corporations not just building public sector industrial states, but taking land for real estate colonies, for hotels, for um, uh, water parks, <laughs> um, things like that, right? So the kind of focus on public sector industry and infrastructure gets kind of diluted and sort of any form of growth becomes a, per, you know, becomes a justification for dispossessing um, farmers. So state governments become what I call land broker states, right? They're just taking land, right? And this is like a lot of the, you know, Greater Noida nearby is a notorious, of course, land grab agency, uh, DDA, uh, expressways become excuses for building, you know, taking farmers' land for upscale residential uh, development and just giving that land straight to real estate investors um, without any sort of broader developmentalist kind of commitment, right? Development now has a very narrow meaning. I wouldn't even call it development. It's just growth at all costs. Uh, in fact, um, maximizing the discrepancy between compensation and market rates of land actually becomes a purpose of dispossession devoid of any other considerations. So I call it the rate of accumulation by dispossession. So basically you have this value, which is the compensation paid to farmers. Then you have, this is the, the, 
public sector agency, the urban development authority, or whoever who takes the land, they keep an increment of this for themselves and actually make quite a lot of money through this route. Um, there's also risk routes through which they make money. Um, this is the value in which they resell it to a private company. And the P3, which you can only, only kind of really estimate and, you know, until it's actually sold or something, um, is the P3. And so what I argue is that actually maximizing this discrepancy has actually become one of the major drivers of dispossession uh, in contemporary India and sort of devoid of any larger developmental considerations. So the most of the book, though, looks at how this new regime of dispossession affects a particular set of villages in rural Rajasthan. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the case. I focus my ethnographic research in Rajpura, which is a village of about, it's not its real name, a village of about 400 families that um, are 25 kilometers from Jaipur, and in 2005, one of nine villages to lose 3,000 acres of land for the Mahindra World City, which is one of the biggest privately developed SEZs in North India. Um, 1,000 of that was public land, 2,000 of that was private land. An additional land was acquired for these compensation plots, which I'll talk about um, shortly. Now, the main salient features of this agrarian milieu, um, I would focus on three. One is there's a rain-fed, um, this is a village dependent on rain-fed agriculture and animal husbandry for survival. Although you could actually make a decent income if you had enough buffalo selling milk. There's a pretty thriving milk industry. Um, uh, but there's increasing water scarcity and farmers were diversifying from agriculture um, to the best of their uneven abilities. Very high levels of inequality. Of course, this is um, Rajasthan and you had failed land reforms that only partially transformed the agrarian structure of princely rule. The Takur of this village evades land reform, holds on to 375 hectares of land when the average is two. Um, and the Jats and Brahmins mostly came out of this process with the most land. Dalits came out with more actually than a lot of other areas of India, but much less. Um, so high levels of inequality, relatively quiet political history. Rajasthan is not known for its peasant rebellions. I didn't find much evidence. No one could remember participation in any of this, or even kind of caste-based movements. So it didn't have a kind of rich repertoire of collective action that you see in some of the other hotspots of land wars in India, like West Bengal. Um, now these features combined with the Rajasthan government's policy of giving farmers these small plots, 25% the size of their original land, okay, instead of the, just the usual below market rate, was very uh, effective at preventing a land war. Didn't create consent, there was no consultation, but now farmers, a very unequal means, were each coming to their own calculations of whether they could benefit from this. The upper caste farmers mostly figured out that they could. They became brokers, as I'll talk about, and, and the laws. But from the beginning, a lot of the poor farmers, lower caste farmers, didn't know what an SEZ was. They were uh, ripped off pretty quickly by the laws. Um, the point is that for now that there was a kind of individualized compliance, but it wasn't a consent process. So as Nandigram was happening, this SEZ actually becomes established. I also argue this made the Mahindra World City probably the best SEZ to be dispossessed for in India, in the sense that um, it was a higher than average compensation policy. These are rain-fed farmers trying to diversify from agriculture. Um, it was an SEZ that actually got built rather than just one that you know was a pure, pure real estate scam and sought denotification and never built anything. Um, so I think it's a limit case for the modernization theory of dispossession. If that theory was to be right anywhere, it should be right here. Now, the field work involved ethnographic field work between 2009 and 16. Most of that was between 2009 and 11 um, when I lived in the village um, for most of that, most of the time, uh, for about a year and a half. Um, not the whole time in the village, but most of that time. And I uh, did a random sample survey of this village and three other surrounding ones, um, which I draw on. And methodologically, this what I'm trying to do here is build on the extended case method. And it's not to argue that this village is like every other village but it's based on a kind of epistemological understanding that macro forces, social forces, can be observed in the micro processes of daily life, in particular milieu. So it's not a generalization from one case to another case, but from micro to macro, and on that basis, extending from case to reconstructing theory. All right, so I'm going to move on. The first initial, the basic initial consequences of dispossession in the village was that it enabled uh, this kind of real estate and knowledge intensive growth in the SEZ. All right, and the Mahindra World City was focused on IT, that was multi-sector. 
the IT was by far the most dynamic and attracted the most companies. And the SEZ model itself really is for, um, is a kind of, the, I'd argue, the culmination of this new regime of dispossession. Um, and it sort of allowed the government to acquire unprecedentedly large chunks of land for private companies for basically what was real estate, right? An SEZ developer takes that land from the government, resells it to companies in half the land, and then can develop high-end residential real estate on the other half. So that's what Mahindra was doing. All legal, of course. And this is the matter of fact. This is the business model. So I actually calculated the rate of accumulation by disposition very approximately, even calculating their land development costs, which they told me, mostly through documents I got through RTI and interviews. Um, even at the very early stage of this project, they were flipping industrial land uh, for 253% um, markup. And based on the value of residential real estate in the area, even though they haven't built their residential colony yet, um, I would estimate that the very minimum, they're going to get 1,500% return on that residential component. It'll probably be more. Um, and that's really by virtue of the government just acquiring land for them and rezoning it. Now, what actually happened, it wasn't all just residential colonies. Half of it has to produce some kind of export um, and so this is basically a tax haven for IT companies, right? This is basically the model. Um, with the SCPI policies expiring, basically all IT companies were going into SEZs so they don't have to pay taxes. Um, whether they're shifting investment is also something that government officials said they didn't really have a good way to figure out. The flip side of this accumulation inside the SEZ was a disaccumulation in the village. Now, the Executives I interviewed with Mahindra said there's nothing here except, you know, dry land, barren land, you know, these bushes that, you know, uh, tore your pants when you walk through it. Um, but that's not true, right? When you look at it, you have to take seriously, even in a dry, you know, um, rain-fed agricultural area, what these assets actually meant to farmers. Uh, it was a significant loss of farm incomes and means of subsistence. Of course, it varied dramatically across the size of land holdings. Uh, my survey documented that over two-thirds of the livestock herds of these villages had to be sold off because of lack of fodder. And, of course, for the big farmers, there's a lot of big buffalo. For the small farmers, even the kind of um, goats that kind of, they got some milk to sell and, and for their family, those had to be sold off. Loss of fuel wood, other resources from the grazing land. Worsening water scarcity, this was very serious, and made them dependent on tanker water that was being brought in from Sanganir that only has water because of the effluent from block printing mills. Um, and so it was actually toxic water that they were drinking for several years. Uh, and these costs were disproportionately borne by women, which is a very common finding in almost all studies of displacement. Um, okay. Now, the main, the point is that uh, not to romanticize the economy that was there before, but it was against these significant losses that farmers would weigh any benefits from the resulting process of economic change. And to the extent that those benefits came, it was almost entirely through real estate. Locating this SEZ all of a sudden in the middle of what was a rain-fed farming village unleashed this tremendous land boom. I mean, absolutely tremendous land boom. Um, this was the graph of land sales in this village uh, every year since 2000. And what you see is a huge spike in 2004. Um, we have 10 times or 7 times more land sales than the previous year. Uh, what's interesting is that the SEZ wasn't announced until 2005. Um, so there's only actually one way that that happens, right? Which is that uh, government officials, politicians tipped off. I have named the companies that bought this up, actually. Um, and they buy this up cheaply from unsuspecting farmers at 2 lakh per biga, and then all of a sudden it's 20 lakh or 30 lakh within a year or two. Um, so there's a huge land boom. Of course, you also see the global financial crisis now ripples through this village, which is now entirely integrated into global financial markets through its dependence on real estate. So you have this boom, bust. It's actually gone boom and bust again since then. Um, land prices go up dramatically. Now, again, I, I talked about the compensation plots that farmers were given. This was intended to buy consent from farmers by giving them some stake in the land boom. Now, they're supposed to have infrastructure on them. And as you can see, there was zero infrastructure, and still there's pretty much nothing there. The Jaipur Development Authority has done anything. But the exchange value of those plots actually went up quite a lot pretty quickly. Um, and now farmers were given some stake in this. But... What I do is I document the ability of different farmers to profit from land speculation. And I find that those outcomes are highly shaped by the pre-existing inequalities um, of the agrarian social structure. So here's the survey 
um, some survey results. Uh, what you can see here is that the so the Brahmins, which are the majority of the general, not on I should say not on this is the outlier of the Thakur, who has 375 hectares of land, right, and who's becoming an absolute multimillionaire, transforming pre-capitalist ground rent into capitalist ground rent. He's got real estate colonies, all kinds of things. He's a broker. Okay, so the uh, um, mostly the general cast and the Jats were kind of shrewdly hanging on to this plot, um, and. They understood that that land was going to appreciate, and they held on to it. They also had not just an understanding, they had the economic means to wait, because they diversified, and they didn't have huge debts, and they weren't under compulsion to sell it off quickly. Um, what you see at the bottom is that the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe families mostly sold those quickly. This survey was on 2011. 82% had already sold it off. Um, and even though the prices were fairly high, um, you can see that the each step in the down cast categories is about a four thousand uh, dollar per hectare. Sorry, I also have a rupee slide, but I was just presenting as U.S. and didn't sh uh, shift it. Um, four thousand dollar per hectare shift um, downward motion in um, how much money they got when they sold those plots. The upper caste are also far more likely to become land brokers, uh, and that's certainly an under reporting on this um, for obvious reasons. So the complex class positions that resulted from this were very difficult to categorize. <laughs> People had plots here, they were doing some work there, and this, you know, so it was very difficult to, um, but I basically organized these trajectories, um, I organized these farmer trajectories into four um, categories. At the very top, you had a class of neo-rentiers. This was the Takur, many of the Brahmins and Jats, um, who became Dalals, big successful land speculators, put that money back into more land, uh, shops, uh, money lending, nothing, almost nothing productive. Um, some tankers to sell water to Mahindra and further undermine the local aquifers, and some construction was probably the only real productive linkage. Um, all the Sarpanches are in this category. <laughs> they all became big brokers. Now in the middle, you had a complex category here, what I call petty asset managers, right? These are people who didn't come out with a lot of money, but just enough to get some replacement land. Maybe they bought a plot in a kind of not, you know, hugely up in colony somewhere near a small town. Uh, maybe they bought a vegetable cart. Uh, maybe they're giving some small loans here or there, moving these assets around, trying to survive without having to sell their labor power. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in this category. And some people, they're just narrowly um, keeping their heads above being a landless laborer. And some who are, you know, maybe on an upward trajectory. The vast majority of the Dalit smallholders were simply proletarianized. Even with this fairly high land prices, given, you know, the average was two hectares per family. That was the undivided family. So that was like the grandfather. When you get down to all the brothers and stuff, it was not enough money when you distribute that. Um, people might have had enough to pay off debts or buy and buy a new house. And often they had nothing left. So they were just shoved down into the pure landless proletariat. The excluded. Um, so then, of course, there were those who had no land, right? They just could not, you know, they could not um, move into an upward trajectory in real estate markets because they had uh, no private property. Now, this is actually a complex category because you had some who had no land but were dependent on the village grazing land in some way, right? So the Bawarias had their house on the grazing land. They were demolished and got nothing. They were just brutally evicted. Um, you had some grazers who had no private land but depended heavily on this for, for grazing land. Now, interestingly, though, there's some landless who actually were totally indifferent to this process, the village sweepers. They had no land, they had no, uh, no livestock, and they, they just didn't lose anything, and they thought perhaps we'll get some employment from this. So there's a complex, actually, um, category. I'd also put in this category women. Uh, by virtue of patriarchal land ownership, real estate was entirely a men's game. Um, even in the case where some widows had land rights, you mostly saw male relatives controlling the plots, controlling the proceeds from these plots, becoming brokers. So after losing um, their role in the agricultural economy and some limited, I would say limited autonomy from the livestock economy, women were entirely shut out of this real estate game. And there were some pretty insidious implications for the um, balance of power in the household which I talk about a bit in the book. So my conclusion here is that this process of real estate speculation made some farmers really rich. I right? see so these big um, gaudy houses and so on. Um, 
But it's a very poor basis for inclusive growth, right? Because it proceeds upon arbitrary historical inequalities in the distribution of land, the failures of land reform, and of course, a patriarchal system of land ownership. But real estate was the only source of value um, that the SEC introduced to the village. Let me to maybe tell me I have 10 minutes left. Just so I can, okay. Because otherwise, they were excluded entirely from the growth that this um, dispossession facilitated. So like two-thirds of India's SECs and reflecting the larger growth model, it was a very knowledge-intensive growth. Um, there was no chance of farmers being employed by Infosys or Deutsche Bank or some of these IT companies that set up uh, in the SEC. They were um, um, also not even getting the construction labor because of the preference for footloose migratory um, labor, which, you know, is widely documented, of course. Um, the only uh, labor, the only work that some people got in the SEC was uh, through contractors as um, security guards, as gardeners, security guards, drivers, uh, janitors. My survey found that 18% of families had one job for some duration uh, in that category. Now, mostly any farmer who lost land um, did not think this was a good deal. Um, the, 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 first of all, these are very, you know, through, through contractors, insecure, low paying. Um, they were actually paying less than the value of selling milk from two buffalo, which most farm families had to get rid of. Um, so I think this upends a little bit the narrative of progress. So, you know, Infosys is so great, but actually, you know, um, there was very little in, in, in this for, for, for farmers. Um, now I also found that Narega, I mean, certainly did not reverse the effects of dispossession. And it was basically killed by 2011 by con the combination of central funding and the local uh, punch, uh, Sarpanch Gram Savik mobilization against social audits in Rajasthan. Corporate social responsibility was a cruel joke. I won't even go into it. Um, but what I argue is that this helps us see um, this marginalization of, of farmers from the growth generated by their dispossession, I think helps us see why even small plots of land, even rain-fed land, can have actually such value um, that the semi-proletarian condition, right, at least having some access to land for income to reproduce your families, is really crucial consideration in a non-labor-intensive growth, where the growth model is not creating sufficient exit routes from agriculture. And I'll argue that this is really a major structural underlying factor under India's so-called land wars. The other dimension of exclusion here was in the way infrastructure was created. Um, and this is, you know, part reflective of the privatized or PPP infrastructure model, which means that the government is no longer trying to create some kind of inclusive infrastructure that absorbs, you know, rural populations, but is leaving it to the private sector, the profit motive of the private sector, which guarantees that things like, you know, 24-hour electricity and good piped water and all these things are concentrated in elite enclaves. So the zone had 24-hour electricity. It had the guaranteed piped water from the Bislapur Dam, um, uh, while there was day-long blackouts and toxic water in the village. Hospitals, schools, all these high-end things were coming into the SEZ, but were unchanged uh, in the village. And actually, I was just there a few days ago, and there was a surprising development that even punctuates this kind of uneven development, which is that the road connecting this village to SEZ is just finally actually was just severed. So the one thing that, you know, was growing the village was like the village market because of the, you know, the small shops and all that kind of stuff. And now it's, it's a ghost town. They just cut off the village from three sides, and all those investments and shops are actually all now devalued. Um, you could play cricket, as people were saying, in the middle of this market. It's shocking because before there was some traffic going through and people could at least sell some things. But now um, really punctuates this kind of unconstrained, you know, um, this sort of relinquishing of any effort to check the uneven development of capitalism, which the Nuruvian state tried to do in the way it cited industrial states, in the way it set up dams, never successfully, but... It was an effort, and that effort is now relinquished. And I think that gives us this kind of enclave development pattern. And there were very few linkages. Uh, I won't, I'll skip over this, but there were very few linkages between the IT economy and the local economy, except by way of real estate and construction. So the aggregate result I call dispossession without development. Uh, this is just a survey. It gives you some sense of this. It's a lot more qualitative ethnographic material in the book, but... Um, you know, I found that 65% of families and 88% um, of SCST families reported having less income 
Um, and at similar proportions, very large proportions, reported having less food and having lost more than they gained from the SEZ. Um, the latter one being a little more subjective and complex to unpack, because that meant different things for different farmers, and I do that in the book. But um, Now, while I argue that this wasn't development, if you mean by development anything broader and more inclusive than growth at all costs, it was very effective at demobilizing this village, undercutting any possibility for collective action, and actually bulldozing the kinds of social relations that would have been necessary for collective action. Though there was these widely spread grievances um, about lack of jobs, and I, you know, it's still very strong. You know, there's no jobs. We're not getting any infrastructure in the village. There's a lot of anger about that. Um, but this process of differentiation by speculation utterly divided this village. And while the huge inequalities between castes, as I showed, there's also inequalities within castes, even among some of the lowest castes. So the Balai Mohalla that I lived in, you can see there's some people living in kacha houses and there's some people living in these two-story concrete uh, buildings. So even in um, small holding Dalit castes, you had some individuals who were able to, either through sheer luck, they hold on to their plot for longer, few utilize the tenuous connection to become a broker, uh, and so on. So even the kinds of, um, even within families, there was such unequal outcome that there was just not the kind of common interest that could enable collective action. The only collective action that emerged was led by the Sarpanch Dalals with the intent of getting these compensation plots developed, which was no use to those who had them any longer. They never raised the issue of the common lands and so on. Um, so those who are still aggrieved, I mean, you have these kind of everyday forms of resistance that were largely not very effective, um, whether it's um, filing a legal case. Sometimes people got, there's a few holdouts. Um, there's these kind of temporary encroachments on the village land because two-thirds of it's still not being used. Um, these are temporary and not really effective forms of resistance. Um, and of course, there's the everyday slander of the brokers and this kind of intra-village class struggle that was interesting but largely not producing anything. All right, so let me just quickly, this is my last slide, if I can take a few more minutes. Um, so that's the kind of ethnographic, you know, there's a lot more ethnographic stuff, but that's the basic overview of the chapters. In conclusion, I try to say, well, what kind of insight does this possibly give us into the contentiousness of land acquisition in contemporary India, um, the cause of land wars, what's going to happen, are they going to continue, etc. cetera. Um, and though I, I certainly am very careful not to try to generalize from this particular village, I do think that in these microprocesses that you can observe, or certainly reflect macro social forces that are not at all unique to this um, area. So land dispossession, I think, is the first and key point. Um, land dispossession in post-liberalization India has been driven by rent-heavy and non-labor-intensive trajectory of capitalism. All right, and I think this is important to just emphasize because there's so much focus on compensation policies. You now, what's Lara going to do and so on? Economists trying to figure out what the reserve price of farmers is, coming up with complex models and so on. But to me, the key underlying issue is how exclusionary this trajectory of capitalism is, right? And that's the, that's the unstructural underpinning. And I think that it's important to understand that this makes even the semi-proletarian condition far preferable to the proletarian. It's not that rural villages are these great harmonious place where everyone's thriving and agriculture is doing so great. We know that's not true. But the point is, how exclusionary must this trajectory of growth be if people still prefer to have small plots of land and a handful of goats, right, than to give it up and be uh, at the mercy of fickle and unpromising labor markets. So I think this has to be understood as really important, right? It's not just farmers defending fertile land and so on and or some harmonious village, but it's a real kind of conundrum, right, that this growth is not creating off-farm possibilities. Nothing like family wages, right? See, one son that has a security guard job, what are you do with other 10 members of the family, and so on. So even youth emphasize this to me. They said, yeah, I want to be a, you know, I want to work in the IT industry. Most of they couldn't get those jobs. But my family is, you know, any job I'm going to get has no chance of me supporting my whole family. So we need this land. Um, so that's why I argue, it helps us understand why the ability of the Indian state or states to dispossess land now rests on their ability to substitute one-time real estate payouts for inclusive growth, right? And that's how I interpret LARA, so the 2000, I'm reducing the absurdly long acronym. Um, that's how I interpret this 2013 effort, um, which uh, Mr. Ramesh kind of, you know, oversaw. Um, now, I think that 
basically what I think that reflects, right, is the Indian state and finally recognizing, right, I mean, it's become politically untenable to dispossess farmers in the way that they used to. And that partly reflects more powerful farmers in the plains that are now affected by these real estate projects and so on. Um, but it's also, you can't possibly legitimize these things as development, right? You can't, you can't ask a farmer to sacrifice for the nation when you're taking their land and giving it to a real estate developer or a reliance who's going to flip that thing for about a hundred, you know, or 20 times more. So, um, I think that's an important thing to understand of why land wars, why land acquisition becomes so politically, um, contentious. In my view, the regime has become politically tenuous. But this, subs this attempt to rescue the regime with land prices has limits. One, of course, is a volatile land market, which is now going down. But the second is the willingness of the state and capital to make sufficient concessions. I, mean, I document the extensive corporate lobbying that, you know, watered down the original Lara um, from, you know, in the compensation levels from six times, not the market value, the assessed value, to down to two to three. Um, also the state, you know, state governments, the pro neoliberal sections of the Congress, there's a relentless lobbying that diluted that bill. And there's no way in which you saw the, I mean, the, and I'm not, and many people talking these huge rates of accumulation by dispossession, multiplying by two by three does not cover it in, uh, almost anywhere. Agrarian social structures less amenable to compromise than Rajput's, right? So this idea of, creating a compromise, a material compromise on the basis of real estate or exchange value assumes what needs to be explained, which is also farmers' willingness to negotiate on that terrain and treat the land as a commodity. Now, we've seen that that's very uneven. There's a lot of places where farmers are negotiating over prices, a lot of places where farmers are burning their compensation packages and saying, absolutely not. Maybe everyone has their, pri has their price, but given the prices and offer, we see a lot of variation across rural India and how farmers are responding. Um, as I emphasized, Rajpur was rain-fed. Uh, people were highly diversified, huge level of inequality, and a sh political history short on collective action. Those three variables, as you know, vary tremendously across rural India, and I think that creates a very uneven terrain for the state's ability to generate compliance and dispossession. And as a result, I don't think India's land wars are going to go away. I don't see how they'll go away. Any, I mean, I don't see how they'll go away. Um, the growth model is going to continue um, as far as we can see. Land sizes are only getting smaller. Now, so what I suggest, though, is that my analysis that this is dispossession without development suggests that we shouldn't dismiss these struggles as obstructions to development. I think what they're doing is obstructing, um, or uh, in the old Marxist framework, obstructing the emergence of a revolutionary proletariat and so on, populist diversions. Um, they're obstructing dispossession without development, or more precisely, they're dispossessed, they're obstructing a highly exclusionary uh, trajectory of capitalist growth. Uh, they are defensive, they're localized, single issue, and they reflect the diverse milieu from which they emerge, right? You have Narmada Valleys, you have Jats in Haryana, you have Goa, and, you know, very different agrarian social structures, and that, of course, shapes their political content and composition and so on. They're politically promiscuous, right? And they're mobilized under almost every ideological banner, right? We can imagine almost every single party is taking them up somewhere when they're not in power. Um, but they're powerful checks on a highly exclusionary trajectory of capitalism and may create openings for more promising ones. Thank you.